Good evening, everyone. It's Betty Felton here from AAUW, the Danville Alamo Walnut Creek branch. We're so glad you could join us tonight. We've got a good crowd and a wonderful, wonderful program for you. Um, I'd like to start and have an introduction to AAUW and to our branch from our president, Joanne Keanu. Joanne? Hey, good evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. And thank you so much for uh, coming into our session. Um, yeah, as you know, we're the Danville Alamo Walnut Creek branch of the AAUW. And that's the American Association of University Women, which is an international organization with uh, over 170,000 uh, members. We, um, we have a mission, and that's to advance gender equity for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. And uh, while, the while the AAUW does that on an international and a national scale, they lobby for new laws, they create a lot of educational programs, they do research into uh, women's equity uh, in the job market. So they're a very active, uh, uh, large-scale organization. With our local branch here, we, we, uh, we are based in Danville, Alamo, and Walnut Creek. We uh, have a couple of uh, key initiatives that helps us uh, further our, our uh, mission. Uh, one is that we provide local scholarships to college women that either went to school in the area or that are living in the area. And this year we plan to give $2,000 scholarships to uh, our candidates, to our, actually our awardees. The other uh, important initiative that I'll talk about or mention is that we support Tech Trek, which is a STEM summer camp for girls between seventh and eighth grade. We provide funding for some of the scholars. And then we also provide volunteers that help make it possible, that help with the sessions and um, help get organized the events for the girls. And I will say that if if as people make donations, we do fundraising pretty pretty much basically all of the funds that we raise go directly to these uh, to our initiatives to help advance equity for women and girls. So that's about us. I will remind you that we are recording tonight. So if you don't want to be on the recording, you need to to um, turn off your video and you can mute your audio but we'll have the recording available on our website after a few days so that people can listen in if they weren't able to come to the meeting or if you're so excited, you wanna listen again. So that's about it for my introduction. Betty, would you like to take over and get us started with the meeting? Great, thanks Joanne. And um, I, I am excited to be here as part of AAUW. Um, because I feel like AAUW is, is powerful and you all are powerful. Um, and it's been a long time that I've had a group of women that I feel so, so energized by um, and connected with. So it's a delight for me to be part of this leadership team. And I hope that you will share um, my thoughts after this evening's program in particular. I'm going to introduce the goals for our evening tonight, how it fits into our, our year-long program focus POSI. And then also um, I'll tell my little bit, my little story um, of how I got engaged in race and racism and how I am moving forward with my journey. That will be followed by our three amazing guests who will share and discuss their stories. Uh, in the context of our lives, we're, we're enriched by stories. And tonight's conversation is an opportunity to hear four more stories. We know that stories have afforded human beings the opportunity to survive even, to grow and to thrive over our entire recorded existence. Stories come to us via our families, our faiths, and our leaders in thoughts and action. 
In my, my faith tradition, this time of year is called epiphany, which I've recently learned means unveiling, revealing, showing, uncovering. And hearing stories uncovers and reveals the experiences of others and gives us new understanding of our own. I just finished a wondrous novel, and I really mean it, it's wondrous. And it's called Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr. It shares the amazing lives of six children from three different centuries. And every day since I finished reading about a week ago, something in my life um, catches a small bit of those stories that I read about. It was that kind of reading and that kind of story that continues to influence me and helps me to understand what's going on today for me. With 21st century technology and now this pandemic, we're looking for understanding. We need more and more stories that give us hope, that strengthen our resolve to be good and to do good in this world. So tonight we'll hear stories of three women that have changed my personal, my personal journey to understand race and racism. With hope that these stories will help your journeys, I'll start with connecting mine in the way that they will present theirs. Lori suggested that we um, address sort of three big questions as we each present tonight. What led you to the work to understand and fight racism? What keeps you going in the work? And where do you wanna go? So my journey to understand and fight racism was started as a young person and was um, assisted mightily by remarkable friends. I have to call them out in honor of a few of those dear people, some who are still with us and some not. Carrie McDonald, Catherine Cash, Tom Williamson, Sandra Redmond, Ellen Moore, and Carrie Stingle. In their love and care, I learned and recognized my privilege as a white, rich, California born and, and raised woman. In high school, my friends and faith community connected me with the American Friends Service Committee and other organizations that called me to evaluate my family beliefs, practices, and behavior. The 1960s, of course, and particularly the tumultuous years from 64 to 68, provided a myriad of opportunities for me to grow and to begin to do some kinds of social action. Though not always a participant, each march or protest provided consideration of, of my role and questioned questions about how I could contribute to this social movement. My undergraduate education at UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco brought scrutiny of how I would behave and act as a nurse. Uh, trying to understand patients, and in those days, doctors at that time, and of course, for myself, how I created my own path in the healthcare world. I attribute that undergraduate work, which was amplified by then 25 years of teaching nursing, to study and practice what we then called nursing strategies. Those were things we could do to help people respond to their health problems. And two of those nursing strategies helped me to learn and act for good with people who are different from me. The first and most important strategy was called active listening. And what I added for myself and my students, besides just listening, was the practice of just being, being with, another person or a family. I found that to be sometimes the only thing we as nurses could do. 
and it turned out to be very, very powerful. Over the years, this being with people has helped me understand the world like no other practice or trend or activity. Even though, as many of you know, I have the urge to always cut in and add when I'm in conversation, my constant challenge with this strategy is to be quiet and to listen and keep listening. And now as I'm closer to the end of my life with friends and family, the power of listening or just being with is the thing that keeps me going. I realize I have this, um, this gift now that was given to me by so many people and so much in my life. And this is a very powerful thing that allows me to keep going. Where do I want to go in my work for racial and social justice? I'm so glad that Lori asked that um, and that we think on this for tonight's conversation. The question helped me begin to organize my commitments, since as many of you also know, I tend to overcommit. Recently, a friend brought me an essay uh, by David Brooks describing another strategy, a new strategy for me to use. The effort to break what Brooks calls the mindset that is tearing Americans apart. It's called the development of social courage, crossing group lines to have conversation. Brooks says that in conversations, people are not objects, but ongoing narrators of their own lives, navigating between multiple identities, steering through certainties and doubts, and refining the categories and assumptions through listening and respect. So this is my current and future work to develop and extend social courage. It is with social courage that we will proceed tonight as we engage with our new friends and colleagues. You will find introductions of our guests on the DAW website, and also you will find an amazing resource list for your further study and action after tonight's program. I am pleased to welcome now Lori Watson, Tanya Earls, and Veronica Benjamin. I think Lori's going to start us off. Thank you, Betty. That was amazing. I told you, I love it. I love it. I love that you got an opportunity to just start us off tonight with sharing your story. It's so important, as you name, that we know our stories that we understand you know, how we got here tonight to engage in this conversation about race. So often people step into this work around, you know, I, I wanna become more conscious around race. I wanna develop a deeper understanding. And we often wanna understand other people's experiences before we even really understand our own. And so before we can really start to dive into that, we've got to ask those questions to ourselves. What is it that I understand about race in my life? What is the what is the learning that I need to do in order to be really clear about how I'm living race and how race is impacting my own lived experience? And so just again, thanks Betty for for kind of setting the tone tonight because I'm just really excited to, to be back here again with AAUW. You know, I had an amazing time. The last time I was here, I had an opportunity to, to spend an evening with this, this powerful group of women and really provide an introduction to this work that I do, which as many of you know, is leading this work of anti-racism. And I get the opportunity to work with schools and organizations across the country, really trying to transform organizations into racially conscious organizations. And so I know some of you were here for that and some of you weren't. And 
if you weren't here on that evening, you'll still get an opportunity to hear a bit about that as I share throughout the evening. But right now, I'm just so honored to have been asked to be a part of this amazing panel tonight. So thanks again for that, Betty. And so I want to begin by just creating some space for my phenomenal colleagues that are here, Tanya and Veronica, to, to answer that question and share a bit about your own story. You know, what is your story and, and, and what brings you to this work? And so um, I don't know who wants to go first, but I'll go with who's closest to me on my screen. So I'll start with you, Veronica. You want to share a bit about your story and, and what brings you to this work? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for, yeah, for everyone for, for making the time uh, to be here tonight. I, I feel a bit bad that I didn't hear about the AAUW sooner because it seems like a wonderfully supportive organization and uh, just a great way to connect with, um, with people in different fields and different, uh, you know, people who have taken the time to enrich their minds and enrich their, their lives and their families and their communities. Um, in terms of what brought me here, I'm a lifelong resident of Danville, California. I'm mixed race. Uh, I, so I grew up as part of a very, very small pool of just any people of color, um, predominantly in the 90s and the early thousands uh, was when I was in the school system here. Um, it actually, I'm not sure if it was, it was entirely regarding the difference you feel from being of a different race, but I definitely felt different very early on. And may, that could have also be due to a psychological disposition, but it was so extreme that I actually left the public school system um, after elementary school. And uh, my, my, you know, my mental state had degraded so much that uh, my parents were willing to fork out the money to send me to Athena in a local private school, um, where oddly enough in our area, I encountered more diversity by going to a private school. Um, and um, I'm very thankful I went to Athenian because I still feel like, uh, I, and I ended up there all through middle school. I did ninth grade back at San Juan Valley High School. Then I got a scholarship to go back to Athenian. Um, so I was able to finish complete high school back there. And they gave me an intellectual foundation that kind of helped me throughout, um, even through, through college, even through my postgraduate work. So it was wonderful to at least have that brief experience of feeling like I was in an accept, accepting community. Um, you know, of course, I felt that my household had a very nice, solid household and family life, but um, especially around the age of 12, when I kind of came to more self-conscious, I was reading a lot of existentialist literature, I um, had a particularly negative feelings and cynical feelings about Danville, um, kind of looking around in, in my surroundings here and seeing how the, the status quo is so viciously guarded um, in this town. Um, Whereas, you know, in Athenian, I would at least interact with people from different socioeconomic backgrounds as well. About a third of the students there are on financial aid and then being, uh, you know, they're coming from all over the Bay Area and even all over the world. So it was a, a great opportunity to get a better sense of the diversity that's out there. But it, it's still it's still a bubble in its own way. And I know current students there, many students there are still, uh, as you know, teenagers are wont to do, uh, feel maladjusted to the idea that they're, they're not really seeing reality. They're not seeing things as, it, as they are. So out of my own sense of that, when I was 19, I went initially to Humboldt State University, then I went through, uh, I, I left the country in 2007 and went to the Netherlands where I completed my bachelor's. Um, I got interested in Indian philosophy and religion, so then I also went for an MA and PhD in Indian philosophy and Sanskrit in uh, Varanasi, India. So I was living there from 2011 to 2019. And so when I came back to America um, after so many years abroad, and, and for me it was also interesting that time in India, I actually didn't know this term of othering. But that happens very, very often in India. And even me, like I'm at, it's funny, I, I married, a, my husband's Indian, I'm in a family. And if you just kind of look at the skin tone, we're, we're actually about the same, but I just don't have Indian features. So unless a lot of me is covered, um, you know, people know immediately I'm a foreigner. And you get called a foreigner all the time by your neighbors and by vegetables. People ask you, oh, do you know how to cook vegetables? And I, I didn't, yeah, I, I never heard of the term microaggression because I'm, I'm very much in the humanities more so than the social sciences and I lived under multiple rocks. So actually I didn't really know these terms and I actually didn't realize the psychological trauma that was building up over years and years and years of living somewhere where it was very obvious I didn't belong. I mean, kind of in retrospect, I realized, well, I never felt like I belonged in Danville. So actually belonging is something very difficult for me to find or feel like I, I'd say, honestly, probably within Athenian and that community is probably one place where I, I did actually briefly feel like I had a sense of belonging. But otherwise, this, this world is in a place where I think that's, that's very forthcoming. 
Um, so anyway, I came back to America in 2019, uh, very late 2019, and I just came back here to work and have access to a U.S. labor market, uh, living with my parents here in Danville. And during the George Floyd uprisings, um, let's say in May, June of 2020, I was on, I think it's the Washington Post maintains a database of police shootings na nationwide, and that's where I first saw um, that there had been a police shooting here in Danville um, of Vladimir Arboleda on November uh, 3rd, 2018. And I brought this up at a protest in, in front of many people, maybe some of you were even there, and I, I was surprised that not many, even just at that point, maybe a year and a half after it had happened, there, it wasn't really in the, the collective memory of the town of Danville. Um, and I tried to find connection, I tried to find other organizations that might be working in social justice and people who might want to uh, make, make an organized effort to, to bring this up and to bring it back into community consciousness. And that wasn't really, uh, that didn't come together. So I, you know, I individually reached out to the police chief. I said, this officer is problematic. I don't feel safe as a person of color. Um, I wrote to our town mayor, which at that time was not Renee Morgan, but um, Karen, uh, forgetting her last name, but, but she and I, no reply. No, Stepper. what's her name? Karen Stepper. Karen Stepper, no reply. I reached out to her. I'm like, I am part of a 1.5% black population in the middle of the George Floyd uprisings. I would like uh, that, that we could have maybe more frank discussions about race in our town. And I just radio silence. Um, the police chief was, was, he gave me some time, we, we talked for 45 minutes, but um, he, he is someone of very many kind words and maybe very few concrete actions. So nothing happened. So I commute to work with the bus. And so there was a man who I'd seen all throughout the winter of 2019 to 2020. He was sitting at the bus stop and he was always very polite, always very peaceful, and I never felt threatened by him. And then in March of 2021, I, I hear through the patch, the local news network, I hear that there's been a police shooting just a few blocks from my house where I usually catch the bus. And I was like, oh, that's very just disturbing. Um, and I, I immediately, I actually, I actually thought it could have been my father because it was just described a person holding a shopping bag was shot. And my father, sometimes we and my family has one car and sometimes he takes the bus to Safeway. And so just by the description, it kind of sounded like him. So I immediately called home in a panic. I said, mom, like, where's dad? And luckily he was okay. But I thought the only other black man in, in like a mile radius of where I live is that man who I used to see at the bus stop. At that point, I didn't even know his name, but I came to find out his name was Tyrell Wilson. He succumbed to his injuries a few days later. And a few days later, they also announced that it was the same officer who had now killed two men, men of color, both with histories of mental illness. Um, Tyrell, couldn't, you couldn't say he was in a crisis, but he just definitely was, did, did not want to interact and wasn't, uh, wasn't um, obeying the officer basically and got a bullet to the face because of that. So knowing that this officer, that there was a space for our community to have uh, stopped basically, to, to, to have spoken up, to express and, and act in solidarity when we see that an officer is problematic and violent against people of color and that we could have come together and we could have raised our voices together and, and really pushed the authorities to do more. Knowing that because we didn't do that, another man was dead, weighed really heavy on my heart. And so that's based, anyway, sorry, we went on a bit long, but that's basically what catapulted me into uh, trying to organize locally uh, with a few other, um, I, I co-founded this organization called Conscious Contra Costa with a few other women, um, two other women of color and one other um, Caucasian woman. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're not as involved now, but I, I see many of my supporters over the years on this call or over the, the past year on this call, and it's been a wonderfully healing you know, having lived so long without that sense of connection, without that sense of community, that, you know, really seeing that there are caring people of so many different backgrounds who are willing to give their time to call into town council meetings, to write letters, to be involved, and to uh, try to promote healing and promote memory. I think uh, memory of what happens, the bad thing that's happened, particularly for Danville, because we, we don't like to think of the unpleasant, we don't like unpleasant things, but sometimes it's from the unpleasant things, from the suffering, from the struggle that we can really learn the most. So I think that's an important aspect of the social activism is to, to bring them up, not, not to rub anyone's face in it, but just to, to keep it in the memory, to, to be complete and to you know, avoid the, the pitfalls of basically having a shadow, having a collective shadow at the level of our, our town. So that's the, the work I'm doing now and, and what, what brought me to it. So now, sorry, I went on a bit long, but pass it on to Tanya. No, that's, that's amazing. I mean, it was a lot, but that means you're doing a lot. And I mean, just, to hear, you know, from the very beginning when you said when you were younger and just already feeling when you were a young girl in school, feeling different, feeling other, not having the words for that, you know, and, and, and that's, 
when we asked the question, what does race have to do with that? All of that was about race, particularly in a largely white community. Because as we, you know, read the research, it says that babies start to recognize race by six months old, by three years old, they're already developing biases and beliefs about race. And so being one of the few children of color in that community, I'm quite sure you were subjected to, again, what you didn't have the language for, microaggressions, you know, subjected to that feeling of being something different. And in the midst of all of that, what was going on as you continue to share your story, I loved how you named it when you said that it was how the status quo was viciously guarded. And we think about how many communities, largely white communities, where those ways of being are viciously guarded and anything that is different than quote unquote whiteness is seen as something else. And it does, you know, create that feeling of othering. I was down in, um, in um, uh, Santa Barbara this weekend and I wanted to go to Montecito because I knew that's where Oprah lived. So I was like, where does Oprah live? I got to go find Oprah's house. And I knew from Ellen's show that she lived right next door. So I'm like, one of these houses, I Googled and it gave me an address and we rode and I said, that must be Oprah's house. So there was a little store around the corner. And I said, what if Oprah comes to this store? We're going to this store. And... Um, so I'm standing out, we went into the store. Of course, we're the only black folks anywhere around, but we're standing there outside. I had gone in and bought a bottle of water and standing out waiting on my friends. And people were coming out, getting in their cars and it didn't take five minutes before a security guard appeared. And, you know, we knew he was nowhere to be found until we appeared. And now, you know, there was an othering. You don't belong. You're different. What are you doing here? There comes an air of suspicion around you. And so um, that's the role that race plays in this society and why we do have to be so conscious about and like you named that memory of what happens because how do we sit in that discomfort? That's the piece that a lot of people don't want. I want this to be comfortable for me to do this work, but no, we've got to lean into that discomfort in order to grow and in order to create change. Wow, wow. Tanya, tell us about you. Tell us your story. Um, hi, I, I, I want to first thank AAUW for having me. Um, this is an honor for me to be here. Uh, my name is Tanya Earls. I am from El Salvador. I was born there. I came to San Francisco at the age of four and grew up in San Francisco. Um, I later moved out to um, San Ramon, where I currently live, um, for work. I am a nurse manager for John Muir Health. And my story um, is mostly in part um, for um, based on my daughter's story. Um, but I want to I, I want to go back and and just talk a little bit about my childhood in San Francisco. I grew up in the mission, so I was embedded in the Latino culture. I absolutely loved uh, growing up in San Francisco, the diversity, um, the food, the culture. It was just so rich. The museums. Um, and um, coming out to, uh, and I lived, I've lived nowhere else in San Francisco until I moved out here to the East Bay. And moving out to San Ramon was different, was different for me. Um, and I was um, the only family member that left San Francisco and moved out um, of San Francisco. So it, it, I didn't have immediate family here, although I did visit them quite often. Um, and I chose San Ramon for the school districts. I wanted, at the time my son was um, in high school and my daughter, I believe, um, was starting elementary school. Um, so she basically um, spent most of her life, you know, her early childhood out here in San Ramon. And uh, my story is uh, for writing uh, my first self-published children's book is based on my daughter's story. 
And as a high school sophomore, um, she attends uh, California High School. At the time um, that this incident happened, it was in 2020, she was a sophomore. And um, it was her geography teacher was teaching a lesson about acquisition of resources. And during this time, um, he developed a PowerPoint that, and shared an illustration from the 1800s, um, which depicted uh, pictures of three different skulls. Um, one, a Caucasian skull, um, one, um, a Negro skull, and I'm using the term that he used. Um, and then the third skull was that of a chimpanzee. And basically, um, there was no clear learning objective to for him actually using that illustration. And basically, um, what he taught on about that illustration was the fact that um, back in the day, um, Negro skulls were compared to chimpanzee skulls because they weren't believed to be um, very intelligent. My daughter was appalled. She was texting me from the classroom. Um, she described the illustration as being very insensitive. These are her words, offensive, and as the only African-American um, in the class felt very humiliated. Um, at that point, she asked, her classmates that were sitting around her, um, aren't you guys offended? You know, I'm very offended. Aren't you offended? Um, is anybody offended, you know, besides me? And um, one female student, she was Caucasian, turned around to her and said, absolutely. She said, she said no, I'm not offended. Um, black people are black because they're mutated. And at that point, my daughter, you know, just felt um, what she described as humiliation. Um, and it just, it, 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 I never felt, I mean, I've always prepared her as a child, you know, having really crucial conversations about race and um, about, you know, how at times, you know, somebody may come across to you as being very insensitive or, um, but I never, thought that this would happen in the classroom, you know, that she would have to deal with so much emotion in a classroom. And um, she felt very alone. And so it was at that time, um, based on the comment that the student made, and I knew, you know, we had a really profound, deep conversation um, when we got home. And it was at that time that it, I explained to her that, um, you know, sometimes children aren't educated, um, you know, on the correct um, form of racism or culture, and um, it's not their fault, you know. And so it was at that point that I made a decision um, that I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to contribute um, to educating children, you know, on culture, on race. And, um, and that's what I did, <laughs> you know, my first book is basically um, speaking on um, four countries in ancient Africa and artifacts that were found there. Um, things that, um, you know, what, what I really wanted to really come across is that um, slavery um, or should Oh, you're muted, Tanya. Sorry about that. Um, what I really wanted to emphasize was the fact that um, African slash Black history doesn't start with slavery. You know, these cultures were thriving um, prior to, um, you know, the people actually being stolen off their land. You know, they, they were thriving cultures. They were doing a lot. Um, and I wanted to mention that in my book. And so I chose four countries um, to speak on, and I wanted to just celebrate, you know, um, their achievements and things that, you know, children aren't taught. So my book is um, geared towards pre-K to first grade. And um, so far, what I've done is I've donated um, my books, and and I'm I'm all for um, 
reaching out to communities and working with communities and donating my book. It's not about making money for me. It's more about sharing and celebrating culture. Um, so I've donated books to my hospital, um, my pediatric unit at my hospital. I have a uh, community resource and in Brentwood, California, well, where I will be doing a book signing um, in February for um, Black History Month. And um, I also have um, some other projects uh, geared up to attend and speak at some schools, some local schools. So um, I'm doing the work to just you know, spread knowledge and really celebrate cultures. Um, another thing that I've actually just uh, completed my second book, which um, is called Maya, which is a tribute to the Mayan civilization. I'm working with my illustrator right now to um, finish the book and I'm hoping to have that completed within the next couple of months. So I'm really excited to do the work and I'm very excited to have connected with Veronica and Lori because I feel that um, they will support me in my work. <laughs> and I see um, Trisha Green here, who I wanna say thank you so much for your support. And um, yeah, so that's my story. You know, I definitely want to pump up Tanya. <laughs> uh, I read her book and uh, it's amazing. And if you can get your hands on it, I definitely, and, and it's what, you know, I, I love that you said it's for, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. This is what kids need to start to learn early on, you know, and this is why it's so important for, you know, even though all the crazy that's happening right now for, for kids to talk about race in school, how does that just become a, a normalized part of the conversation? We're supposed to be thinking kids to think critically, you know, how much more critical can thinking get when you're bringing in all these multiple perspectives around the social construct of race? And so when we don't have those conversations, when we continue to make race this taboo subject that we're supposed to ignore or pretend that it doesn't matter, then people like Tanya's daughter have those experiences in school. Then someone like Veronica ends up leaving her school because of, of how she's treated. And we end up in these, these situations. I was thinking about when, when you named how when you were living in the mission versus what it was like when you moved out to Danville. And I thought about this quote from Dr. Wade Nobles when he said, um, culture is to humans as water is to fish. And we think about when we take people out of or put people in a situation where they are actually being, I don't know if I want to say suffocated or starved from being who they are authentically in a place that is not conscious that we're having these different experiences based on race. And it's not pointing a finger or blaming, but it's about how do we get to this place of consciousness that recognize that when a child who is black or a child who is Latino or Asian or white shows up in these schools, they're having these different experiences based on what they look like. And so we've gotta be in a place of consciousness and recognize that. And so as I hear your stories and, 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 and think about what's going on right now in society with all this uproar over critical race theory, with all this pushback to anti-racism work to the point where people are passing laws and legislation, people are getting fired from their jobs for, for talking about race, administrators for, you know, just explicitly naming some things around equity. You know, as you hear all this, as you face all this in the work that you both do, you know, what keeps you going? What motivates you to, to stay in the fight, you know, and, and, and how do you take care of yourself in the midst of all of this? I know, Tanya, you're a nurse, so uh, 
you know, you can just check your blood pressure and see what's going on. <laughs> uh, um, how yeah, do you all, I, yeah, how do you keep going in the midst of this? Um, with everything going on in this world besides, you know, race, um, I, I meditate. You know, I, I really um, do self-care and I put that as a priority for myself. Um, I meditate, I do music therapy, um, I do yoga, I do things um, to make sure that I'm balanced so that I'm able to show up, you know, not only for myself, but for everybody else. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's and, important. And it, it, it is. <laughs> the thing about it is not even just dealing with race, but, you know, that intersection, you know, mm -hmm. so you're dealing with race, you're dealing with gender. And then me, I'm the lucky one. I get to throw in uh, <laughs> sexuality too. So I get to live life at the intersection of being black, female, and same gender loving. Yay, me. I want to <laughs> jackpot. And yeah. so, you know, just navigating all of that. What about you, Veronica? I wish I could say I meditated more. <laughs> uh, when, when I can, I do. And it's always very uh, wonderful just to be kind of taken outside of. Uh, you know, taken outside of myself and you really kind of hit that, that bliss. Um, when I don't have the focus to meditate, I at least hike. Um, I think mm -hmm. nature has always been my escape. Yes. Um, Las Trampas is this beautiful range. Um, so just being able to, to walk up in the hills. And I, I've done that ever since I was probably 13 or 14, just because we also, we, we live in a valley. So just also being able to literally reflect on society and kind of stand and then look out and then get some perspective and look at the beautiful Mount uh, Tuishtak or uh, just, you know, Mount Diablo, um, which uh, it was funny. It was only when I came back from India that I realized that that mountain must have been holy to many, many people because pretty much every other mountain in India is a Kailash, is like a holy mountain, <coughs> or the, you know, the Axis Mundi. Um, so it, it's nice now in adulthood to reconnect with this space and to try to get a sense, even though it's not, let's say, my culture, to get a sense of the sacredness of the land. Um, because sometimes, yeah, when I don't feel like I have the capacity to, to calm or ground myself, um, it's, it's pretty easy to do that in, in nature. So that's that's good. And comedy. I, I have to say, when, since I don't meditate, I'm very distracted and I get very run <laughs> down from work and stuff. I, I really enjoy uh, all, all different kinds of, of, of comedy. Yeah, I was about to say, you all are much more evolved than I am because I just turn on trash TV. <laughs> that's the way I escape all the madness give me a real world uh, or housewives or somebody like that and I just go to another place and I'm feeling pretty good I, I, I also think that um being creative is a form of meditation for me because I'm focused you know when I'm writing or I'm painting or um even when I'm just listening to music or just spending time in solitude, I think is, you know, meditation doesn't mean to be quiet, and, you know, have your eyes closed all the time. It means, to me, what it means is um, to really be focused and in tune with yourself, you know, and it could be while doing an activity, connecting to nature. I spend a lot of time at the beach because I'm really connected to the water. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I feel just uh, really grounding yourself and being connected, I think, you know, is a form of just really decompressing and honoring yourself. Nice, nice. Yeah. So we, we, we wanted to have this conversation and also have an opportunity to engage with you all. And, you know, we're just kind of sharing a, a bit of our stories and we didn't know if you all had any 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 questions or anything for us that you were curious about or, you know, we didn't want it to just be us being the talking heads, but uh, also, you know, connecting with you all and really building this community where we could share our stories back and forth with each other. So mm -hmm. I just want to kind of create some space if anybody has anything that they wanted to ask or offer at this time. I see PVC 119. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm going to call you PV. Uh, Trisha. That's Trisha. I, I met you at Pine Valley, Dr. Law. You're where? I heard you speak at Pine Valley Middle School. Yeah. And then yeah, I yeah. came up and told you about Tanya. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I'm back there soon. I, I love that we're connecting. It's just perfect. I want to say that um, you know, meditation. 
and I would like to say that I know Tanya and, and I'm listening to Veronica and I'm getting to know you better. You know, to challenge oneself to go into a community where they don't speak your language, besides not look, looking like you, is what the job is all about. It's very, very safe to stay in, in, you know, in an area where everybody agrees. So I think that the three of you are brilliant, but very strong women and are doing the work that has to be done. Because you can, you know, you can talk to you, the same audience and, and you're not going to go anywhere. And I, in my own work, that was, that's what I said when I left my, uh, my schooling. I said, now it's time for me. I think I lost somebody. Now it's time for me to go into a community that knows nothing or cares nothing about what I believe in and which I believe is very important. So, um, so oh, hi, Ken, is that you? Okay. Now, the other thing I want to say, and then I'll let someone else speak. Um, Tanya's daughter was my student for, for a few years. And uh, she and I connected so beautifully. I mean, every day she came in to see me, she either was making me laugh or making me want to throw her out of the class. Either <laughs> one. I love this girl. This girl had friends of every culture. <clears throat> There was no, there was never an issue about her color. She loved them all and they all loved her. So when I found out from Tanya what had happened, it just it was the wrong person. There was never a moment of anger or racism or feeling different in her daughter. This is a, this is a bit, maybe this is good because Tanya has done something. She's turned something that was very bitter into something very beautiful. And most people want to legally fight. And, and, and you know, Tanya went up to the district because she called me. She went up and she spoke to, I don't know, she spoke to the superintendent. She spoke to his principals. She, and Network. nobody responded to her. I mean, they just, you know, shook their head and just, they wanted her to go away. But Tanya didn't go away. And she's also offered her book to so many people in the, in the school system and no one's taking, she's giving it for free. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very safe book about African culture and she's giving it to young children. If they don't learn it then, why do they have to learn it when they're 19 years old? After, you know, it's etched into them. So I, I give her a lot of credit for doing what she's doing. And she has never said anything nasty and never started a fight. She just said, this is what I want to do. And she walked away and did it. So th that's what we need to do. Don't ever, you know, don't give up. Just maybe, maybe make a de detour and do it again. So uh, her daughter is, if you met her, you'd understand. So it's a blessing, Tanya, no matter, no matter how much you get into your space and meditate, you have done a beautiful job. Thank with you. Thanks, Trish. Thanks, okay. Trish. I want to, there's a bunch of hands up that I want to acknowledge and have asked their questions. And dear Zoom, it puts it in an order. So Brody Hilp is first with hers. There you go, Brody. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I just wanted to share my experience. Um, I had sort of an unusual brother. He had lots of different books around the house. And when I was around 12 years old, I picked up a book called Black Like Me. And it was about a man who had um, he was white, but he had made, he had darker skin and he made himself dark and he had uh, traveled in the South and he experienced prejudice and he wrote about it. And it just really touched me. And ever since then, I've had a lot of empathy and, you know, um, his books are really, really good. Um, um, then um, we moved, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio. We moved to New Jersey for high school. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia in the 60s. The high school was about 2,000 white people, maybe uh, six or seven black people, and then maybe six or seven Jewish people. And um, needless to say, it, we, you know, I, would just, <laughs> I just couldn't stand being there. And I just had so much hate just being in school because these people were just so prejudiced. And what really got to me is that they would, um, in the South, they have this thing of being cordial. And so they'd have this air of being nice, you know, but it was, oh, it was just awful. <laughs> I had 
terrible uh -huh. experience in high school. And um, anyway, that's my background. <laughs> Thank you, Brody, so much. Appreciate it. And these are all interesting things to learn from you. And Julian, is it Julian Brown? It's Julianne. Hi. Hi, Julianne. Please go next. Thank you. I am up in Auburn, California here, um, and newly appointed to the AAUW's first ever DEI committee. Oh, great. <laughs> so I am, and I'm also on the school board up here. And we also are, are very, um, uh, let's put it this way, we are not a very diverse community. We have one school that is largely um, Latino, Hispanic, uh, but we are, uh, the, the phrase that Veronica used, which is the status quo is viciously guarded, I think is, um, fits very well with our community as well. Um, so I am just looking for, you know, ways to start up this DEI community, community committee in our community um, and seeing how best to start. And Tanya, happy, happy to take those books and distribute them to our children. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to connect and uh, see what we can do with that. But um, just looking for some advice on, on how to, to begin, this, the, um, begin this effort. Oh, thanks so much, Julianne. It's nice to meet you and welcome. And at the end of, um, at the end of this session, um, you'll see on, on this website, but also on our DAW, IAUW website, a great list of resources, both written and events and people. And there are also through faith communities around the communities. And you may look to some of your faith communities because they're all developing anti-racism teams and efforts in DEI or anti-racism. So um, stay in touch. And I'm sure that, and dear Lori has lots and lots of, um, of ideas about how to connect um, and you'll have access to all of this information and we look forward to having you join us anytime. So much. Mm -hmm. Is it Pat or Ken Chris. 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 Hi, Hi Chris. Um, <clears throat> I am a member of AUW. I have been since 1987 as a matter of fact, which That's is when, right. when you were enough to allow us to join. Uh, but the reason I'm, I'm speaking is I, I was on the school board uh, 92 to 2000, which I know is a very long time ago. At that time, there were four AAUW members on the school board out of five members. Uh, Joan Buchanan, Marianne Gagan, myself, and Stu Goldware, who was a San Ramon AUW member. And uh, shortly after then, I acquired a mixed race grandchild who went to, I think, Monte Cadero, wasn't it? No. It was Walt Disney. Walt Disney. It, was, it was Walt Disney. And she definitely experienced a fair amount of racism. So because I was on the school board, I sat down and talked to the superintendent about it, who was actually quite a good superintendent, but in total denial, there could possibly be anything like racism in the San Ramon Valley School District. Well, this, of course, is ludicrous. Um, it's been there forever. It is still there. In fact, it's just as bad as it always was, just as a uh, bias against LGBTQ as well, which is been a factor in our school district for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about what to do about something like this, you have to look to institutions like school districts and particularly school boards. And without wishing to be rude, I will tell you that we have a, a substandard school board at the moment who has zero interest in dealing with this issue. And so one of the things that we need to do is get to back to what we did do at the end of the 80s which is to get AUW members elected to school board. Uh, we, we made an enormous difference in the school district when we, we joined the district. We actually um, had two school board members recalled, beat another one, completely replaced the school board, fired the school superintendent, solved our financial problems, solved our teacher rate, labor problems, and we were quite effective. Currently, the school board is in no position to do anything like that. And so I really think it's extremely important that we think about those people we know who would make viable candidates for the San Ramon Valley School Board, because that is where that sort of change needs to start. And if the school board has absolutely no interest in getting involved in this and indeed becomes, as most school boards have, defensive, then we're not going to get anywhere. 
I'm too old, uh, so I, I, I'm certainly not going to run for the school board again. But I would sit down with anybody who's interested and talk to them about what it takes and what it's like and what can be done. And AUW has a, a very good record of putting people on school boards and indeed other local institutions. So we really want to think about that as a strategy for the branch. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. Boy. And AAUW was very involved in the recall and all the, that's when I joined AAUW the first time is because they were considering an AIDS curriculum and they actually had people on the school board who said AIDS was a hoax. They did? Oh, you bet. And um, it, it changed a big part of my civic engagement as well. So that's a great offer of the solution is to get those women and AAUW members in office and in particular at the school board level. Great idea. And who's next then? Cheryl Williams, is it Cheryl Williams? You skipped Susan. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan Hayes. You need to unmute. I'm unmute, okay. So I have a couple of questions. I'm also from Auburn, California. Um, Veronica, I didn't, hear what you do for a living. You said you studied in India, got a couple of degrees. I'm a yoga teacher, so I'm very interested in what did you find as a job when you got home? Yeah. And also for Tanya, I lost the internet right when you, I didn't hear what the girl in your daughter's high school class said about the skulls. So those are my two questions. You wanna go ahead, Tanya, and answer? Sure. She she didn't necessarily say anything about the skull. She said she was not offended by the lecture or the comment that the teacher made because uh, Black people are Black because they're mutated, is what she said, which I, I had no idea, you know, what how that correlated to the lecture. It was just a question that my daughter had asked about uh, the classmates being offended. But she took it a step further. It was offensive enough and then somehow made the, the situation worse. Um, yeah, but uh, I guess Susan's a first question. I, um, yeah, I, I realized that getting a PhD in the humanities, I mean, that at least I wasn't in debt. I was very thankfully supported by my parents. So I had all that time to, to study and reflect. Um, I was a bit disillusioned about the yoga community. I actually went into ancient Indian thought versus ancient Greek thought, which was, let's say, my first love, because I thought, oh, maybe at least I could teach yoga teachers after this. But um, actually, the, it, it's, it's very complicated around, I mean, cultural appropriation and, and making money off of it. It's something I would love to do, um, especially with the Sanskrit, the language aspect is, is more where I focus. Like, I, I don't do a lot of asana practice, like physical yoga. I practice more the dhyanas, like meditation or, or the language. Um, and I just didn't find ad avenues where I didn't feel like I was selling out. I think there are responsible ways to do that. And I have a lot of friends, especially in the East County, in, in like Yuba County and near um, Nevada City in that area. Because I know there's an Ayurvedic college. I know many people, mostly Caucasians, but people who teach and embody the culture in a, a totally, in, in my opinion, at least appropriate way and manage to do it. But it's a huge undertaking. So I, I just applied for admin positions. So I'm, I'm working in admin for a financial advisor. I applied for about 100 jobs with a PhD. And then that's kind of what I got. Um, so that, that was also a so also a journey, um, which is why I say an organization like this is so important. And, I, and I'm sad that I didn't have maybe adequate support through when I was in university. And I was entirely in an Indian institution. So that, that's also, I didn't fully understand. I was very focused just on the knowledge and I didn't realize how important the networking and the support systems are to, to really finding kind of success, especially in a career trajectory. So I learned that the hard way, but at least I'm not in debt. That's it. Thanks, Veronica and Tanya. Now we're on to Cheryl. Uh, hi, I feel I feel very actually very comfortable in this in this conversation because uh, by profession I'm a training and development professional and I worked at McKesson for ten years. I was on the diversity council at McKesson. I also joined last year a group called Rise Equity. So I occasionally do uh, I occasionally do diversity training, but I moved to Danville from Philadelphia in 1994. So my, uh, my daughter started at Sycamore Elementary School. So I lived in Danville, I think, for 18 years. My son started at um, uh, Monta Vista. So I also lived in Danville. And I now live in San Ramon. So <laughs> I feel real comfortable in this space right now. 
but I just really didn't have any questions for you all. Just wanted to add my story to your stories because I, you know, lived in Danville for 18 years and then moved to uh, San Ramon after that. And uh, my, it's very inter it's, it's a very interesting story because my kids, uh, I have a daughter and I have a son, and they pretty much they really assimilated very well. Uh, you know, coming from the East Coast, from Philadelphia, coming to, you know, to Danville, and they assimilated, and I guess I'll tell my daughter's story first, which is my daughter started at second grade, and then she, uh, she moved through Charlotte Woods, and then when she got to Mon, she was supposed to go to San Ramon Valley, but um, I wanted the closed campus, so she went to Monta Vista <laughs> instead, some of, some of the parents will understand that, uh, she assimilated so well that she probably didn't realize that she was so different because she hung out with her friends. She was just one of the one of, you know, she was just with her friends until this infamous party uh, that she went to at Blackhawk. She was, you know, I was out of town with my, my then husband and she was invited to kind of a last minute party at Blackhawk which I found out about later on. And apparently when she went to this party at Blackhawk uh, with, with some friends, she and another Black person were the only two Blacks at this party. Um, I think the other, uh, maybe, yeah, I, she was out of, con I mean, people didn't really mess with her. The bottom line is um, this, uh, this party happened, kids from Concord came and you know, they must have came to disrupt and, you know, they were fighting and doing all this other stuff, you know, disrupting at this house. And the bottom line is nobody, my daughter didn't get hurt or anything like that because she was out of place. You know, it was like they couldn't figure out, you know, who she was or why she was there. And she was kind of blocking and that type of thing. But the, the important part of my story is that because this you know, these kids from Concord had come in and I think they may have been part of a gang or something like that. So they somehow got into the party. But what happened was my, my daughter and her friends were able to get out. They all, you know, got into one car, went to the hospital. My daughter had to come back to get her car. And that's where all the action started because uh, when she came to get her car, the police were out there, you know, the lights were all over and Blackhawk and everything. And they see this black girl going to get her car. And the officer said, oh, were you here at this party earlier? And she says, yeah, I was. And she, he said, well, will you give me a statement? And she said, sure. And so she, you know, she left her car. She walked with the officer as she approached the father who had now come home to found, find out that he had had a party. His ho house was in disarray. His son was in the back of a police car. As she started to approach with the officer to give, give a story, the father saw my daughter and nigger, what are you, nigger, get off my property, nigger, and what are you doing here? Get off my property, blah, 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 blah. And my daughter is standing there looking at the police officer, waiting for the police officer to say something. Police officer didn't say anything. And she's, she's, he's just calling her all out of her name. Now this, understand, she has never been called nigger before, ever. And uh, this this father was just go just laying into her, calling her all, all out of her name, and and the police officer said, "Oh well, let's just go across the street so I can take your story." So she's looking at him. She's you know she's all hyper from this this thing that had happened at the party, and she goes across the street. He's trying to take her story. He's still calling her out of her name. She says to the officer, "Aren't you going to make him stop?" aren't you going to make him stop? And he's, he, he didn't say anything to the father. So she just was like her mother. She just handled her business right there. And the bottom line is she was traumatized. She was absolutely traumatized. And she was, you know, gave the statement and eventually got her car. Now I was out of town then, but when, she, when I came home and she said, mom, I got something to tell you. Let me tell you, my blood was boiling when I heard about what happened and I wanted a story from the police department as to why they didn't protect my child. And the, the, you know, without going into a lot of detail, I got the run around Veronica, just like you did. 
I got there. I wanted to, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, I found out that it was the Alamo, somebody from Alamo, a police officer. I was ready to, you know, I went to the town council. I did everything to say, why didn't this police officer protect my child? And I wrote a letter, whatever. It just kind of fizzled. You know, nothing really ever happened. So I, you and I, uh, Veronica, we had that police connection. But, you know, eventually I did, I did tell the police officer at, with Blackhawk, I said, I want to hear from the father. I want the father to call me and have a conversation with me about why he was going after my, you know, 16 year old daughter. I said, if he wants to call somebody a nigger, let him talk to me. And, and he, eventually he did, uh, the father, I will give him credit. He did call and uh, apologize to her. And then he spoke to me and I, you know, I, I, I mean, I didn't go off on him or anything. I said, but I said, being an adult, you should have known better than to say those words. But I said, this is the first, I said, my daughter is a, a, a 16, 17 years old. I said, this is the first time she's ever been called that before. So now all of a sudden she realizes, you know, even though she assimilates very well, she is different. Okay. So anyway, that's my, 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 my daughter. So my son isn't, isn't as, is as, as traumatizing, but he went through Monta Vista and he was a, he was a very, very good student. So in 1998, uh, there were, there were four students in Monta Vista that got accepted at Stanford. And my son was the only male. And then there were three females. Well, there were all kinds of, he got, he got in because he was smart and he did, you know, worked hard. And there was a lot of questions asked about, well, how, how, did, how did he get into Stanford? You know, assuming that there was some kind of affirmative action or there was some kind of special whatever and, and whatever. And I just listened to the chatter and I didn't even bother to address it. So, you know, he, he still has friends that he hangs out with uh, from Monta Vista. So both of my kids assimilated very well. But those are just two stories that stand out uh, in my mind because everybody wanted to know how my son was the only one in 1998, uh, the only black that, that got into Stanford and you know, how did that happen? So that's my story. And Veronica, I did wanna say that there is a group in, in uh, the Danville area called the Diablo Black Men's Group and they do handle issues around social justice. And I can you know, connect you with, I don't necessarily know who the president is, but I, I know people who are members of that and they deal with social issues, social justice issues in, in the area. That's my story. Thank you, Cheryl. Wow. I knew this would happen. Remember, Lori, this is what we had hoped for. So thank you so much, all of you, for your comments. Lori, um, we haven't heard how you got into race work. Well, uh, uh, look, Isabel has her hand up. Let's hear from Isabel. Oh, where's Isabel? I'm sorry, <laughs> Isabel. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thank you. Um, I, 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 first of all, I want to thank you, Betty, for putting this program together and thank our panelists. Um, it's, it's been very um, heartwarming and, uh, and at times struggle to, to listen to these stories. Um, Cheryl, I'm sorry, but what happened to your daughter and, you know, and all of you and your experiences. I will, um, just a little bit about myself. I am a Latina. Um, I'm originally from Southern California, from a little town called Pico Rivera, uh, and a largely Latino community. Uh, I came up to go to Cal and uh, then decided to stay here. Uh, and my husband and myself, my husband is Chinese American. Uh, and we have two Chino Latinos uh, sons that we've raised, and um, they're very proud of that. They speak um, Spanish fluently. Uh, I've been able, um, as a lighter skin, and and uh, you know, someone, and I've been told I don't have an accent. Um, I have been able to assimilate in the community. Um, I still feel a little bit as a fish out of water. Um, I will say I I'm, I'm, don't always feel like I totally fit, um, but the issue of uh, racial injustice hit home during the pandemic with my sons with the issues of violence against Asians because um, they have a nice mixture, but they do look Asian. 
and seeing what was going and happening um, to the Asian community during uh, this pandemic, uh, for the very first time, I felt fear for them that I hadn't ever felt before. So um, this issue and this topic is very near and dear to my heart. Um, we had um, with the uh, death, uh, the murder, really murder that we had at the end of May um, of, of um, an African-American, uh, yet another one, and there were several before then that we were dealing with. Um, those uh, those and, um, just kind of exploded for us in our household. And so this work is incredibly important. And um, thank you all for what you do. Oh, wow. Thank you, Isabel. Now I'm going to be able to call you Isabel. Gracias. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Is there anyone else that I missed that would like to share? Okay, then, Lori, where do you want to go from here, my friend? Um, I'm not sure. I... Um... I know you asked me what was my story and oh let's get Deborah. Look, I keep giving mine up to everybody else. Let's get Deborah. Deborah, go ahead. Sorry, Lori. <laughs> I just I really want to hear your story, but um I just wanted to comment on on two beautiful ideas for me tonight amidst a lot of troubling stories, of course, but um did I, Veronica, did I hear you say that you, you lived under multiple rocks? Did you say that? Yeah, I love that. And I just wanted to point that out to people because um, everybody has that phrase, you know, do I live under a rock? And to say, you know, no, everybody in this room here, in this Zoom room, thinks that we don't live under a rock. We know that this stuff goes on and we're pretty aware and we are AUW, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't ever really think about living under multiple rocks. And once you lift one of those rocks off and you say, oh, now I'm, I'm good. I lifted that rock off and so now I'm really aware. And um, just to think, you know, there might be some other rocks you're living under that you should be cognizant of. So I was just, I'm just really excited that you said that <laughs> because I'm looking for my other rocks that I should try to lift off. And it's pretty cool. And then I, I wanted to ask you if you've heard of a, an organization called Outdoor Afro. Have you heard of that? So I got... Lisa. I, what? Oh, please tell more. That sounds like a wonderful group just by the name alone. I'm just excited about this, this organization because I was wondering what I could do to, um, to somehow help. I mean, I'm just a white person in Danville. So what can I possibly do when there's a lot of other white people in Danville? I don't know what to do. And I'm also involved with Save Mount Diablo, like Betty Felton is also. And um, I thought, well, Outdoors. Outdoors is a spiritual place, a place that people can um, share that spirituality. And um, maybe I should I should do something so that more there's more opportunity to get into the outdoors. That it's more 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 awareness for people of color. But then, you know, I had this feeling I don't want to be that white woman savior person that sails in and goes, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, save you. And then I heard about this organization. I thought nobody needs saving here. May I share my screen just a moment? I'm going to share this screen. Um, here she is. 
So can people see this? Mm -hmm. This is the Outdoor Afro Organization. Um, just an amazing organization. These people don't need help. They're doing it. And this woman, Rue Mapp, is, I just, I read a lot about her and I thought, oh my gosh, she's a true leader. And that she's got all these people that are helping bring outdoor experiences to people of color who might not ordinarily feel empowered, but not only can she bring it to them, she's bringing people of color opportunities to lead that effort. And the leadership effort she goes through is, is amazing. So I just wanted to call people's attention to that organization. Where is it based, uh, Deborah? Uh, it's based in Oakland, but Perfect. it has it has um, branches in a lot of different places. I think U.S. wide, not everywhere, but it 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 is um, pretty widely spread now. Terrific, terrific. Can we add that a website to the resource list? Are you there, Deborah? Sorry, I muted myself. Sure, I'm gonna put it in the chat and I'll also put it on our website as a link on our DAW website. Great, well, how about questions? Tanya and, and Veronica, did you wanna say anything or can we put Lori on the spot? <laughs> That's fun. Um, I just wanted to share that um, out of um, me writing books, I've started my own um, company called Kidtastic Creations, where I will be selling my books. I've created some puzzles that go along with um, Ancient Africa, the current book. Um, and I plan to not only um, write books about culture, I have... Um, two more books planned for the series of Ancient Africa. The, the second book will be Tosseti and the third will be Kemet. And then um, I have also um, finished a book uh, with uh, a really close friend for Meditation for Children. And um, I have plans to um, write several books. <laughs> I have so many ideas, um, but I'm gonna be, you know, um, I, I created the company so that that's something that my daughter can take over, you know, when she's ready to do so, so that she can continue, you know, with the journey and the work. And um, I'm just um, really excited to really now be part of, of the work and really getting down to connecting with people and being able to, to um, network and make connections and donate my books. Um, I really wanted to say um, a, a quick thank you. I, I see that my one of my close friends, um, Fawn, and her twin sister, Acacia, are on. And they were actually two of the very first people that um, started this book journey with me. And Acacia wrote uh, the description for my book. So I just want to say thank you. I see that you're both there. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your support. I just want to lift up one word before uh, I let Dr. Dr. Law, that's such a great uh, <laughs> go. Um, I just, just the importance of, of moving away from Eurocentrism. So I say this mostly to lift up Tanya's work because that's just putting a name to what we've been uh, going over and, and having, I had a huge privilege. I, I come from, actually, I I've always identified more with my privilege being from Danville, having resources, assuming I was going to college. Um, but I had the privilege of living outside of the U.S. for a long time uh, and really being steeped in a non-European intellectual tradition. And that really, um, it really, it really changes you. And it's really difficult to get that perspective. So I think it's wonderful that we have a book like this that um, children children can start that journey earlier rather than later. And I, I also just want to connect that to, to Lan and, and what she was saying about uh, how, how to work on this. Um, and in addition to moving away from Eurocentrism by any means uh, possible, um, also uh, 
listening, like you see that so many of these stories come down to people were not being heard. And that's where a lot of the frustration kind of builds on when people deny racism. I just think that's one of the most kind of violent and frustrating things that, that people in power, especially in predominantly white areas uh, tend to do, because I, I wanna believe that we can, you know, forgiveness is possible, but you know, that we can listen, that we can move past hurt. Um, we're, we're offending each other all the time. I think even once you are offended, I, I even believe there, there's some work to be done to, to, to come to meet to whoever offended you and to also practice that at a human level, at the level of compassion. And of course, you, you know, you have to have a certain bandwidth and a certain lack of trauma to be able to do that. But I think in the, you know, in the human journey, it's an important space to come to. That's my last two words. And, and also, and also really focusing on, um, educating and promoting emotional intelligence, you know, not only for children, but for adults who don't really like her teacher, you know, he was a young teacher in his thirties, young, you know, a young teacher. And, you know, I just don't really understand, um, you know, we are a human race, you know, and, and to just really be compassionate and really understand it and really love one another and celebrate each other for, our diversity is what's really important and needed in this world right now. Yeah. You know, as I listen to both of you share and thinking about this work and how you're talking about the humanity in this, part of what I do is I talk about how race work is, is love work. Race work is soul work. Race work is humanity work. How do we begin to see each other you know, how do we begin to see the humanity in each other? And what racism has done has just dehumanized people that we can't see each other in, in, in that light. And it does become, you know, this fear of the racial other. And also this idea that if you get, then something's going to be taken away from me this zero sum game that people lean into, this idea, this belief. And so when you mentioned, Tanya, about, you know, your teacher or, or even the police officer that was so traumatic for your daughter, Cheryl, you know, what people have to learn in their ignorance or lack of knowledge or understanding or consciousness, and there really are people that exist who just haven't had the experiences of being with people who are different than they are. There really are people who just don't, who don't know. And that's what I love so much about what you named, Deborah, and that you're involved in these organizations that are in, in Oakland that are quite diverse. You're, you're continuing to learn, you're continuing to read because it's not just enough about, there are so many people who will sit at home and read book after book and watch documentary after documentary, but that's not gonna get us to where we need to get to. How do we engage with people who are different than us? Because if we've been conditioned to believe that certain people are X, Y, Z, then when those people appear, our implicit biases are still gonna surface. We gotta continue to, to be in community with people and develop and build relationships and acknowledge that we do all have biases. There's none of us that are immune to biases. We do all have racial biases, but how do I get to a place that when they do surface, you know, I can, I can reason myself through them. And there are so many people who just don't have the capability of doing that because they haven't tried to do it or because of, again, of their conditioning or whatever it is. And so as I think about, you know, you all and, and, and the community that you're in, I love that AAUW is continuing to do this work. And I also look at what the AAU chapter looks like. And so how do you diversify that chapter? in order to develop those relationships, in order to build that community. And that's just an important piece of the work as well. And so this is just how we get better and stronger and build the muscle in the work. It's awesome that we come and we talk, but then how do we, how does that become just a normalized part of who you are as a chapter and, a, and an organization? And so, um, 
I think what you're saying, Deborah, is just so important. You know, I, I, I do a lot of work out in Marin County and I have educators who say, you know, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I say, well, all you got to do is cross a bridge. It's a whole lot of people that look different than you on the other side of that bridge. And then it becomes, you know, well, this excuse and that excuse. And so, you know, it's not just about the, the, the knowledge, it's about also having the willingness to lean into that place that's necessary in order to do this work and create that change. And again, it goes back to your own story and what is my true understanding about race in my life? And, and, and oftentimes, and, and Barb has been in this seminar that I've done where I ask a simple question of how much is your life impacted by race? And it never fails that the majority of my white participants, when I'm saying on a scale of zero to 100, say my life is impacted by race at a very low number because they only think it's impacted by race when they're in the company of people of color and fail to recognize that white racial experience that happens. You know, I, oh, well, it only happens when I'm at work or whatever. And so just really getting conscious about what does it mean to be white? And that's not just the work of white folks, that's the work of folks of color too, because I heard Cheryl when she talked about how her daughter had really assimilated into the community. And so often people of color lose themselves because they're just trying to navigate for survival and, and, and give up so much of themselves in order to fit in. And then what happens is a traumatic experience like that, that slaps you back into reality, that even though you might, you know, assimilate in, still that visual of race identifies who you are. And so, you know, I've shared this story with some of you before, you know, just growing up in Mississippi. And there are folks who say, well, I know that must have been a horrible experience, but I, I, I'm, I'm named for people. I don't believe that I really began to recognize or experience a negative impact of race until I got to California. That's when it was most obvious to me. And so, um, you know, what happens here is a lot of colorblind racism. You know, we don't see race. We don't notice race. Race doesn't matter. But those biases still kick in and, and show up in those moments. And so what, what got me to this work is when I did come to California, having grown up in Mississippi, hadn't go, having gone to two historically black colleges, having lived in Atlanta, someone said they lived in Atlanta and being in a community that largely looks like me and feeling, that's what I refer to as, you know, if I've ever had any privilege in my life is being in Atlanta as a black person, because that's a black city. And uh, my uncle tells the joke all the time, the only bad thing about Atlanta is it's surrounded by Georgia. And so you got Atlanta and then you got Georgia. And so uh, I lived in Atlanta for a long time. And, you know, so I didn't, I wasn't, and this is my journey as conscious about that negative impact because I was really insulated in a lot of blackness growing up. I grew up in a community in Mississippi where my dad was a businessman. Our neighbors were black doctors and lawyers and people that owned businesses. And so that was excellence. I just knew that was the norm. Coming to California and not having that experience at all. And, you know, the first school that I, district that I worked in, a woman came up to me and the first thing she said to me was, can I touch your hair? You know, how often do you wash your hair? This was California. And I'm thinking I'm coming to, you know, swimming pools, movie stars, the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, the whole fanciness of it all. But I felt like here what people thought my experience in Mississippi would have been like. And that's not to say Mississippi doesn't have its issues. Definitely still, yes. But that was my experience. But coming out here, and really starting to recognize and get more conscious about how race was showing up. Because in my mind growing up, 
racism happened to those people, you know, and it, because it wasn't a personal experience of mine. And so having that shift and change uh, being out here and working in a school district where we were doing this work is how I got engaged in it. And I became a part of the district equity team. And we were working with an organization by the name of Courageous Conversation. And as a part of my district equity team with my superintendent, we would present at the Courageous Conversation National Conference every year. And one time we were presenting and Glenn Singleton, who was the president of the organization said, I want you to create your own seminar. And I thought he was losing his mind, but um, he said, no, I want you to create your own seminar. So my initial seminar, the title of it was Trust Me, Gay is Not the New Black which was about the intersection of being black and being same gender loving. And anyway, I, I, I created that seminar, facilitated it uh, at the next national summit and did that for a couple of years until finally he said, now nah, you need to come work with us full time. And so having worked with that organization for, for five years, I mean, across the country with, with districts, you know, I've worked with Google, I've worked with all these different entities, I'm, I'm doing work with, with at Cal and all these different places just really pushed me into this next level of understanding about how race shows up in these ways that if we're not looking through our lens of consciousness, we won't see it because it's become just so normalized in our society. Racism is normal. It's like the air we breathe, you know, and so it, it's in our traditions, it's in our culture, it's in our celebrations. And if we don't show up in a place of consciousness, it's going to continue to thrive. And I think about when you named George Floyd and you saw people start to rise up. But I also see now a year and a half later, people going back to business as usual. And so if we don't wake up, when we think about the laws that are being passed, when we think about who's being placed into positions as federal judges, as school board members, as Chris named, and all of this, then we're in trouble. And, and, and when we talk about activism, it doesn't have to look like people out in the streets marching. Yes, bless those folks too. We need those definitely, but also... How do we show up in the boardroom? How do we show up in, 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 in corporate and, and just having conversations with people who look like us? Because racism isn't going to be impacted to the degree that it needs to be impacted until white people are more comfortable talking to other white people about race. That's what's got to happen. Because black folks of color, we can sit here and talk about it all day long. But when we're talking about a system of power and we know who holds that power until those people have a willingness to change, to engage. One of my colleagues said to me one time, people who are anti this work are more convicted than people who want things to be better. And I thought about that. We look at these people, these people storm the Capitol to maintain the status quo. We just talk about it quietly. We've got to get, we've got to be the loud voices that create the change. And so why do I do this work? Because I believe in this work. I really do. And I've seen it in action. I've seen it just create spaces where people start to shift their, their thinking in schools. I've seen how it's changed, how classrooms operate. You know, I see how people can do things in, in their organizations in order to create a space where people feel a sense of, of belonging. It, it, it just, I believe this work can change the world, but again, it takes all of us interdependently to come together and do what's necessary in order to do that. And so again, as I think about my story, your story, how do we continue to develop this story? How do we continue to grow this story? What are those opportunities that we can take to do that? And I'm always trying to figure out what else do I need to do? And so I just hope 
you know, that we all leave this space in that same place of what do I do next? What do I do now? How do I engage? Yeah. Wow, I'm in awe. Uh, of all of you, um, I knew I would be in awe because um, I had an inkling with Tanya and Veronica and Lori. But then to hear from you members and friends who, who are engaging yourselves. And that's what we wanted from tonight. I know our, our regular time is kind of, um, it's kind of getting less and less, but I did want to reiterate the questions that Lori gave us and that some of you responded to, but I hope that many of you will do this work in the following days or months. What led you to think about and try to understand race and racism in your life? What keeps you going and, and intrigued and disturbed about this work and what you know or are uncovering, uncovering and revealing that you need to do? And where do you wanna go with it? How can you make some some changes in your own in your own being and in your own life that are going to progress you and all of us on the journey. I know that that is what I want to do as a, a facilitator of this evening. And we've had this amazing panel and the people who came forward to tell their stories to help us along. So with my great thanks to all of you, and particularly Lori and Veronica and Tanya. Wow, what a wonderful chance to be with you and to hear. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>